<coughs> so I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, Tisha Simmons. Uh, Tisha hails from the community of Galena. She is a central Koyakin Athabascan. Uh, and it's interesting, I, I've asked a lot of the speakers here uh, to, to give me a couple pointers on how they'd like to be introduced. You know, what, what to them are the couple points that they'd like me to make in introducing their presentation. And I think you'll see um, from Tisha's, Tisha's speech, uh, what she actually said is, I, I'd like you to introduce my family. I'd like you to introduce who I'm from, my family. And so um, I'm proud to introduce Tisha Simmons, who's the granddaughter of Sydney and Angelina Huntington, the late Jenny Huntington, the daughter of Marie Simmons, and of the late James Walden. So thank you very much for joining us today, Tisha. Let's give a big round of applause for Tisha. My grandmother was an amazing woman. Her name is the late Jenny Huntington. She came from a small, tiny little village on the Yukon River <coughs> called Manil Gadzata. In Manil Gadzata, there's about 100 people that live there, and that's if nobody leaves town that day by air or by river. My grandmother had a reputation of being a reputable hunter and fisherwoman. Upon her passing, the elders shared so many stories about how she was the first person in her community to get a beaver in her sets, to catch a moose, a fish, and how her children were always dressed very well in very nice skins and furs. She raised her children mostly as a single mother. She was simply amazing and always comfortable. I have the best memories of waking up in her tiny one-room home with the smell of pancakes in the air and with heat coming from her wood stove. And even though the only bathroom was an outhouse in the yard, or if it was colder than minus 20, a honey bucket in the porch, it was always comfortable, and I never questioned my comfort there. She was also a devout Christian. I think that to this day, I think that some of the people she admired most in her life were the people in Fairbanks who would pick her up on Sunday to bring her to church. All week long during her city visits, she would worry. Who is going to bring me to church? Who is going to give me a ride? And those were the people she loved the most. It was very important to her. My grandmother was also an alcoholic. She drank heavily for most of her life. She died at the age of 92 in a nursing home. And I think that if she would have been able to live outside of that nursing home, she probably would have drank until the day she died. I often wondered, growing up, how such an amazing, strong woman could also struggle so much with alcohol. It wasn't until my sophomore year at the university that I was assigned to read a book. The book was called Yerok, The Way of the Human Being. This book introduced the term historical trauma to me. You can change slide. Historical trauma is defined as one generation's exposure to a traumatic event that continues to affect the subsequent generations. The life of my ancestors was very, very different than the life we hear today, we see today. Yvonne talked a little bit about that. My ancestors followed the animals. They traveled from winter camp to spring camp to summer camp to fall camp, wherever the animals and the resources went. They had spiritual ceremonies that they practiced, and they used all of their resources to the fullest extent. Just to give you an example, fish heads were eaten in their entirety, including the eyeball and the cartilage. My daughter still giggles when I eat the eyeball in front of her, and she can't believe I, that I still do that. <laughs> also, bags to carry items were made out of moose stomachs. So you can see that resources were used to the full extent. That was the life of my ancestors for tens of thousands of years. It's not a life we'll see again, but we will see hints of it. Things changed very, very rapidly. Gold was soon discovered in Alaska, and with gold miners came new practices. Alcohol was introduced. And the type of drinking that gold miners took, partook in 
was binge drinking. So very quickly, Alaska Native people learned that type of drinking. And if you know anything about binge drinking, it leads to addiction very quickly. Additionally, missionaries came to Alaska. And whether people agree that their message was good or bad, oftentimes the way they delivered the message was bad. Oftentimes, vaccines were withheld until people converted to Christianity. There are stories of entire families being found dead in their homes because of influenza, a disease that, nobody, that Alaska Natives did not have immunity to or access to an immunization for. So with that came tremendous grief. Also, schools. Yvonne talked about boarding schools and how his mother left for school at the age of six. My mother left for school at the age of nine. She traveled to many different boarding schools over time. And although not all of, the, not all of them had experiences like this, many had experiences of physical abuse, sexual abuse, and emotional abuse, and spiritual abuse. So where did these children learn to be parents from? Often from abusive parents parent models. Resource, resources had new regulations put on them. No longer were you able to fish when you were hungry for fish. No longer were you able to hunt for a moose when you were hungry for moose or needed it. No longer could you even cut wood for your family where maybe your ancestors had got wood from for many years. So what do we see as a result of this, this historical trauma? There are symptoms. I remember coming to Fairbanks and feeling ashamed about who I was because of the color of my skin. I never denied that I was Alaska Native, but I never held up a sign that said I was either. If someone asked if I was, I said yes, but I always made it a point to not say it myself because I was used to hearing comments about the drunks walking around town, the Alaska Native drunks, how Native people are drunks. And there was a sense of shame that came I was this little girl from the village, and there I was proud of who I was. But here I was associated with symptoms of historical trauma. Other symptoms include Alaska Native men between the ages of 15 and 24 years old have the second highest suicide rate in the world. Not just in the nation, but in the world. We see high rates of domestic violence. We see high rates of children being removed from their homes. And these are all symptoms. They are not who we are. Upon learning about all this, I asked my grandma, what was it like, grandma, to grow up in a time where all this was happening? She sat at the end of my bed and she looked down at her hands and I saw tears coming from her eyes. And all she said were two words. We didn't. And then she just stopped, got up, started walking out of the room and said, I don't want to talk about it. And that was the most we ever discussed. So while we still experience some of the highest rates of suicide, domestic violence, sexual abuse, removal of children from our homes, while we experience many of those things, there are glimpses of hope. We have apologies from churches. We have language and cultural programs. Even in our schools, one of my funniest memories is being in the kindergarten in Galena in our little schools. And I, I think to go back, if I could see one image, if I could go back in time and see an image, it'd be this hilarious image of about 20 little Alaska Native kids in the classroom, bobbing up and down, singing Frere Jaca in French <laughs> <laughs> on the Yukon River. <laughs> I still know the words to that song. But now we see language immersion programs 
in our Alaska Native languages happening. We can get a Bachelor of Arts in Yupik at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. We see our youth and our elders reaching out to one another to learn our ceremonies and our practices. We see the President of the United States dancing with Yupik children and traveling above the Arctic Circle for the first time in history. We have meetings and conferences just like this to discuss community sustainability. And we see children with a high interest and a pride in learning. Research has suggested that there's a solid tie between strong ethnic identity and wellness. We have an opportunity before us today and for all of the rest of the days in our future. We have an opportunity to go beyond discussing the Arctic issues that I'm sure you all came here ready to discuss. These discussions aren't going to just impact energy and climate. They're going to, we're going to have the opportunity to delve into some of the most sacred places of people's lives. Healing must occur for Alaska's first people. If you aren't able to relate to what I'm talking about, I want to ask, and even if you are, I want to ask everybody in here if you're comfortable with it, to close your eyes for a minute. I want you to imagine an entity coming into your life, into your family's home, and I want, them, I want you to imagine what it's going to feel like when they tell you, I'm going to take your children today. If you don't have children, I want you to think about maybe your nieces or nephews. And you're not able to see them for the next 15 years. No longer are you allowed to speak English or whatever your first language is. No longer are you allowed to eat your top 20 favorite foods. No longer are you able to take part in those practices that fill your soul, whether they be going to church, maybe hiking, maybe skiing, maybe meditating, maybe yoga. You can't do any of those things anymore. And then I want you to go out and pursue happiness, that inalienable right that we all have in America. I want you to go pursue happiness with all of that missing from your life. That is the level of healing that must occur, is overcoming that. This week, when you're talking about climate change and sustainability and energy, I want you to remember those children that are out in rural Alaska's villages and Alaska's first people who are living in the urban areas. I want you to remember that this is an opportunity for us to really work towards sustainability that could impact those sacred places of emotional well-being, purpose, safety, identity, that there's children out there who are depending on us. I think about my own daughter. This is my daughter and my grandmother holding hands. But I think about my daughter who's now 11. I think she was about a year old in that picture. I think about her, and I don't ever want her to look down at her hands and have tears falling from her eyes and say we didn't. I want her to look people straight in the eye and confidently say we did. Thank you.